we'll see how it goes. <laughs> well, um, good morning. Um, this is going to be a very different talk than my last one. <laughs> uh, my name is Joe Cheng. Uh, I work at our studio. I'm a software engineer. Uh, and uh, for the last couple of years, I've been working on Shiny, uh, a web framework for, well, I'll tell you what it is. Um, so I have a feeling that a lot of you might already be familiar with Shiny. Uh, can I see a show of hands who here has actually used Shiny before? Oh, good lord. Okay. <laughs> um, so there are still uh, some people out there who, who um, have not worked with it. So I'll, I'll, I'll spend uh, about um, maybe a third of the talk talking about uh, what Shiny is, and then I have some, uh, some new stuff that I uh, guarantee you haven't seen before. So, so um, I always start talking about Shiny with the same four slides, and um, Really, it starts with the motivation. So why did we make Shiny? Um, it's really, we wanted to take all the things that we really like about R, um, the, the state-of-the-art statistics, the, uh, the amazing visualization, and uh, the community and the packages around it, um, and address some things that we saw as lacking in R at the time. Um, R, by and large, is a personal experience, not a shared one. You tend to work alone on your desktop computer or you know your um, your server session and your gaining insights um, by looking at your own console and your own plots. Uh, and we wanted to make it um, something that was much easier to kind of share your, your knowledge with other people. Um, and when you do have outputs from your um, R sessions, usually it's in static formats like PNGs and PDFs. Um, and also a lot of modern visualization these days is happening in the browser. There's really cool libraries for JavaScript that are, um, that are really making uh, it, it very easy to experiment with, with new forms of visualization. So we wanted to address all those, and Shiny was our answer to that. Um, Shiny is a package that lets you easily create your own interactive web applications around your R analysis. So it is not a, uh, in, intended to be a general purpose web framework. It doesn't replace Ruby on Rails. You wouldn't build a web store in, in Shiny, probably. Um, it is designed for people who work with R to analyze data uh, to build cool interfaces on top of them. Um, it does not require any web development skills, no HTML, uh, CSS, or JavaScript. And that was really important to us to be able to tell any R user or anyone with um, the ability to write a function and subset a data frame to be able to say, you are ready to write Shiny apps if you, uh, you know, just look at these few pages of uh, getting started. Uh, that being said, I've been a web developer since 1996, and the idea of working on a framework uh, full-time that would hold me back and restrain me from uh, doing whatever I wanted to do uh, in the web browser, um, it felt terrible to me. So Shiny's also designed to let you go hog wild with uh, web development uh, skills if, if those are available to you. Um, so, Shiny is designed to look good by default, but very customizable also. It's designed to integrate with uh, libraries like D3 and Leaflet and, and what have you. Um, and it uses a reactive programming model, uh, which I won't get into today as part of this talk, but um, to me, really represents a dramatic leap, leap forward in how you're able to create user interfaces very concisely uh, and robustly using R. Okay, uh, so in case you have never seen a Shiny app before, this is not going to work. <laughs> Okay, good, I have local copies of most of my demos. Um, so this is about as simple as it gets for a Shiny application. Um, this is your everyday Iris data set that has been demoed to death. Um, we've got a selector on the left for the x-axis, a selector for the y-axis, and uh, as I change these, um, you can see the plot immediately updates. Um, and I'm using uh, the k-means clustering al algorithm um, to, to the, have a, uh, an assignment here with the colors representing the set membership and the X representing the centroid for each cluster. And as I change this cluster count, uh, we can see what it looks like with different numbers of clusters. Uh, and all this is 
just these two files, this is the source code behind this application. So in total, maybe a couple dozen lines of code. Um, and you can see here that the actual uh, analysis part is just your everyday R code. You know, we're calling some subsetting, we're uh, calling k-means, and then we just do a normal plot and call points. So um, pretty straightforward. And the UI.R uh, file uh, it indicates what the user interface should look like. And here again, it's a very literal translation of what you see on the screen. And again, it's only using R code. So extremely simple to get started. And, uh, and you can build things that uh, before Shiny uh, would have taken a little more effort. Um, so that's a very simple example. Uh, we can get quite a bit more complex if we like. Oh, this is going to be right. So there should be a map of the United States behind here, like uh, Google Maps. But we, um, since I don't have internet here, uh, you can just see the outline um, from the data. Um, this is a. a zoomable map that shows uh, zip codes of the United States. And um, the uh, size of the data points represents the population. Um, I can click them to see an exact number. And the color is either red or blue. Um, and the blue zip codes represent the most affluent, best educated uh, zip codes in the United States, uh, the, the 95th percentile. And you can see that they kind of tend to cluster around cities. This is Seattle here, um, and the Northeast in particular around New York and uh, Washington DC are just saturated with these things. I can change what uh, the representation of the map means. Um, I can change the color to re represent, rather than a binary, is it a 95th percentile or not, um, have a continuous grade of, um, of, the, of that score that, that ranks their um, income and education. And down here, uh, I have two plots, one that represents uh, a histogram of that percentile score, and then the other a scatter plot of uh, income versus college. And as I move around the map, you can see that those plots update. So I can uh, zoom into some particular part of the country and see um, how they're doing versus other parts. Um, there's also a data explorer tab here that um, lets you look at the raw data that underlies uh, that map. And, and I can filter this down to you know, a particular city or a particular state. Um, I can combine these filters so I can compare uh, Seattle to Portland. And, uh, and then maybe rank that by their score. And uh, this entire app is um, 350 lines of our code. And again, no, no HTML uh, was necessary. Uh, let me just show one more. Oh, this one's completely not going to work. Um, that's a shame. Uh, so those two apps were used for uh, exploration. Yeah, this is totally not going to work. Um, what this should be doing is pulling live uh, information from one of our RStudio servers. Um, we run our own CRAN mirror, and uh, it's quite a popular one. And uh, what this should be showing is um, live down, like a live feed of, of downloads that are being performed on the RStudio uh, CRAN mirror right now. And, uh, and you would see a bubble chart filling up. Uh, th the main thing to take away here is that uh, shiny apps don't just need to be used for exploration. You can also have these kind of dashboardy type things that um, are designed to um, to let you monitor live data that up updates in the background. So, um, so uh, in terms of what. Uh, what we're doing and, and what we're going to be doing in the future with um, Shiny, in case you've been keeping up with us. Um, uh, one of the things we have added recently is brushing capabilities for base graphics and ggplot2. So um, 
in case you have plots that you want to interact with directly by, by drawing a selection directly on the plot rather than um, you know moving sliders and things like that to the side, those are now available not just for new JavaScript-based visualizations, but even for base graphics in ggplot2, and I'll have a demo of that in a moment. And um, another thing that we've heard from Shiny users is that they'd like more tools for analyzing their application's uh, performance and for fixing bugs, and uh, that's something that we're, we're working on as well. Um, and uh, we've also added um, a whole new set of options for uh, enhancing um, for people who are very deep into JavaScript for enhancing the way um, Shiny communicates between the browser and, and the server and having all sorts of hooks for you to customize that. Okay. Um, so that's just a taste of Shiny. If this is something that you're, uh, you know, haven't used before and are interested in getting started with, uh, shiny.rstudio.com is our source for all things Shiny. I can't. Um, oh, good. I have screenshots. Um, so you can at least see uh, we've got a very detailed tutorial um, that that can get you started from from zero, uh, and then dozens of articles uh, for diving into specific topics about Shiny, and a gallery with many many examples, including uh, some of the ones that I showed today. Okay, so now for something totally different. Um, there is a particular um, uh, sorry, I just blank for a second. So, um, shiny gadgets. Um, as I was putting together demos uh, last week for this talk, I realized that there's a particular way of using shiny that has uh, been a little underutilized, I think, in the past, and uh, we thought it was kind of time to bring it to the fore. And um, I want to explain what a shiny gadget is by first explaining what it's not. Um, I want to contrast shiny gadgets to shiny apps. And uh, I took this quote from uh, Roger Peng, uh, his Coursera course, uh, Developing Data Products, he says, a data product, and in this case, shiny apps are generally data products. A data product is the production output from a statistical analysis. Data products automate complex analysis tasks or use technology to expand the utility of a data-informed model, algorithm, or inference. And for me, the keywords here are production output. You've done some analysis, you've come to some conclusions, and now you're building something that can be an artifact for other people to, to engage with your conclusions or to do some exploration on their own. But the bottom line is, you've done your analysis, you've done your work, and now uh, here, here is an output. Not, not to say that can't lead to more work, but, but still, this is something that you've, you've done your analysis and, and now you have this, this object. And uh, shiny gadgets, in contrast, are an interactive tool designed to be invoked straight from your R scripts or from the console to assist with analysis tasks that are inconvenient to tackle with code alone. So the difference is, a shiny app is like a report or a dashboard, and a shiny gadget is like a tool to help you actually do your analysis. So what do I mean by that? Oh, um. Okay, so um, I've got a ggplot here. Oh, sorry, this is meant to be hidden. This is just a regular ggplot here. Can you guys see that okay? Um, and this is showing um, just the uh, air quality data set and I'm plotting ozone uh, versus temp. Um, so there are a couple things that uh, I'd like to be able to do here. So plot one is my ggplot object, just like we normally create them. Um, and I've made a function called ggzoom. So I'm gonna run this. And um, unlike most shiny apps, it didn't pop up in a separate uh, browser window. It's showing right in my uh, viewer pane here in our studio. And, um, oh, oh, it just redrew the plot. Okay, so uh, I can make a selection here and choose to zoom in on a particular part, and, uh, and it zooms in. I can hit unzoom to go back to the original view. Um, so, that's not the slickest zooming you've ever seen in an interactive plot. But uh, the cool thing here is that I can give um, almost any ggplot that I can come up with, I can stick into that ggzoom uh, function and, uh, and it'll work that way. So, um, you know, in this particular example, it's a very small data set, so it doesn't really matter, but you can imagine much denser data sets where zooming in really helps you, um, you know, deal with overplotting issues and, and things like that. 
Um, another thing uh, we can do is to uh, use these tools to identify points. So I can hover over some of these points and you can see at the bottom now, uh, it's showing me the row number and then uh, the associated uh, values for that row. Um, and another thing we can do here, let's, uh, let's look at the diamonds data set. Um, so here I faceted it by um, the cut. And um, what this tool, this ggbrush tool lets us do is examine some subset of this data. So I can uh, select out, you know, maybe some of these very good ones. And it says I have 72 observations selected. Um, and if I hit done, this actually gets returned to me as a data frame right to my R console. Um, I forgot to save it to a data frame, so I can do that now with dot last dot value. And now I can do you know, whatever I can do with, uh, with a data frame. And so that's one of the, the main differences, uh, other than the fact that it's showing up in our studio and it's designed to be invoked as a function, is that these gadgets can actually return values to the caller, so you can use them um, straight within your R scripts or from the console interactively as you're trying to, you know, make sense of your data. Um, so, uh, going back to the iris data set, this example, I can make it bigger. Uh, this example um, shows three separate ggplots of uh, the same data, and uh, I can make a selection in one of these plots, and it will, uh, you know, link them to, to, the, uh, to the other plots. Um, I can make a selection in any of these plots, it'll show the others, uh, and including one-dimensional plots, I can just drag on the x-axis for a histogram, and it'll um, similarly work. And again, this is with any three GG plots you can come up with, um, or we can do uh, you know, just two of them instead, and if I run that same code, then it shows up with two instead of three. Okay. I guess that's just another example of the same thing. Um, and then, um, so one more example with ggplot is um, if I have a bunch of data here, I've taken the cars data set and um, I've added some outliers uh, because there weren't any. Uh, so now, if I'm viewing this data, um, you can see that there are some uh, cars here, some observations that have a breaking distance that's negative, so clearly that's wrong. Uh, and if I select them, um, I can remove them. Uh, and if this one, for some reason, I decide is an outlier as well, I can remove that. Um, and I can undo and reset. And again, when I uh, am happy with my result, I can hit done, and uh, it comes back again as a, as a data frame that I can then continue and use. So. So these examples used ggplot um, just because I, I thought it would make a good demo and also because I don't have any particularly useful domain experience in statistics. So um, uh, I limit myself to you know, these kind of toy examples. Uh, but the point is that um, this mechanism is generally useful and can and be used for uh, all sorts of different purposes. Um, so just to talk about the difference uh, between some of the differences between uh, shiny apps and shiny gadgets. Um, so as I said before, apps represent the output of an analysis while the gadgets are used as you're performing the analysis. The Shiny app, you're building that usually for end users, whether that's collaborators or the general public uh, or you know, stakeholders in your business. Um, whereas the um, audience for Shiny gadgets are people actually interactively using R or writing R scripts. Um, shiny apps are deployed on servers and Shiny gadgets are invoked directly from R as functions. Um, the way you write these are a little different as well. When you write a Shiny app, you do it in a UI.R or server.R file. In Shiny gadgets, you define them in line in a function, maybe in a package or something like that. Uh, and for Shiny apps, uh, it's really just user input and external data that drive uh, 
the outputs in a Shiny app. In a Shiny gadget, you've got that and function args. So whoever's invoking you can pass in data or pass in even a callback function or, or, whatever, or whatever you want. And that's something that's very difficult to do in a regular Shiny app. Uh, shiny apps don't return values. What would that even mean when it's running on a server somewhere? Uh, and a Shiny gadget, because you're invoking it as a function, can return values that you can then go do further things with. Um, and this is what it looks like to write one of these shiny gadgets. Um, this is uh, stuff that's very new, so we don't have this documented on our website or anything, um, but, but we will. Um, so if you have done some shiny before, this probably looks familiar. We've got um, UI, oh, we've got uh, a UI uh, variable where we're declaring what the application is going to look like. We've got a server function that determines the behavior of you know, what plots get drawn and where. Um, and, uh, and then we have a shiny app call at the bottom to actually create the application. Uh, so the things that are different about a shiny app is uh, this dialog page uh, is custom to work well within that uh, viewer pane in our studio. Uh, when things want to render in a small space like that, you tend to want to fill up the area rather than have a scrolling page. Uh, and dialog page is a function that I've written uh, to help you do that, and it will hopefully be in the next release of Shiny. Um, then you have to have this little chunk of observe event input done that tells uh, R what to do when the done button is clicked. And uh, often we will calculate some kind of return value that makes sense uh, for that particular gadget. And then uh, calling stop app is what causes the application to stop running and return the value to the caller. So anything that you can do, uh, anything you can return from R function can be returned from a shiny gadget as well. Uh, and then finally, when you make your Shiny app object, this little incantation at the bottom uh, will tell our studio to run this app in, uh, or run this gadget in the RStudio viewer. Uh, if, your, if your app doesn't make sense to run in the viewer, then you could also leave this line out. Uh, and, and this also works fine from ASAR if you're not an RStudio fan. Uh, it still works, it just launches in a browser instead of in a dedicated window. So um, I've touched on some of these use cases already with the demos that I've shown, but uh, these are just you know, the things that uh, Winston Hadley and myself thought of in a 10-minute conversation about what we could use gadgets for. Um, so scalable viewing, I mean, I've definitely heard from a lot of users that we're often working with data that we both need to examine from a very high level to look for patterns, but then once we see an interesting area that we want to zoom in and, and, uh, and tease apart the individual observations. So, um, you know, you could definitely imagine gadgets for all different kinds of data in R that would be really helpful uh, for letting you do that at different levels. Um, subsetting um, for, uh, you know, whether it's exclusion or just because you're interested in a, in a particular, um, you know, part of your data. Um, viewing high dimensional data, link brushing is always popular. Uh, and, uh, and then these, these kind of iterative tasks that are just really uh, frustrating to do um, on your own. So for example, if you're, if you're um, trying to tweak uh, some parameter in a model uh, to make sure you're, uh, I don't know anything about statistics, if you're tweaking a model for some reason uh, and you, you want to iteratively look at the output, um, that can be something that's a little bit annoying to do in a code-based environment. And um, if there's a shiny gadget for that particular model or whatever, then you can visualize it and interactively tweak it. And when you're done, you get parameters back. and. Uh, and then code generation, uh, this requires a little bit more explanation, so I'll, I'll, I'll show you. Um, how are we on time? About 10 minutes. Okay. Oh, I better go quick. Uh, so on Saturday, uh, the Obama administration released a data dump uh, for this college scorecard data set. Um, has anyone seen this over the weekend? Okay, um, so I guess one of the, the one of the things that the Obama administration has been talking about for a while is that they want to help college students make better decisions about what school to go to, not just based on some arbitrary ranking of, of how good a school is, but what are the likelihood of students who graduate from this uni university or college actually paying back their student loans? Did it actually result in them having salaries that are higher than you know the average high school graduate? Um, and uh, they were going to come out 
out with a ranking, and after looking at the data, I think they decided, you know what, here's the data. <laughs> it's, this is really complicated, so, so here's the data, and they also made a web app that lets you kind of explore based on your own criteria. Uh, so I heard about this last night and um, decided it would make an interesting gadget. So let's cross our fingers. Um, the interesting thing about this data is um, it's several hundred megabytes and it covers the years 1996 through 2013 and it comes in a CSV file with 1700 columns. So, you know, if, if you're looking for some particular piece of information, it's a little bit of a needle in a haystack. Um, and a lot of public data sets we deal with are like this. Uh, if you look at census data, you have to take a course just to figure out how to use the census data. There's just so much that's part of it. Uh, and for the college scorecard, um, uh, I wrote a function, uh, read here, oh, args read. Um, where you pass it the years that you want and the columns that you're interested in. But how do you know what columns you're interested in? Uh, so I wrote a gadget for that. So you say iRead for interactive read, and this is showing you all the columns that are available. There are 168 pages of them. Um, and uh, the column ID is on the left, so this is what the column will be named after you import it, and on the right is a description. And this is searchable, so I can say, um, give me Sorry, this is a little zoomed in. Uh, give me the institution name. Uh, I want the latitude and longitude. And um, let's talk about admission rate. And uh, let's say 2013 is fine. I can select a range here if I want. Um, but let's keep it to one year. And then uh, if I want to, I can filter it by school. So um, if you start typing. Okay. Uh, but I'm going to leave this blank, so I'm going to get all the schools. Uh, so once I'm happy with that, uh, I can hit read records. Uh, it's going to take some time to parse the data. And then here's my data set. Uh, so I've got the data set here. I can save that. Uh, and it also shows me this is the code that it executed in order to get that data set. So I can copy that and put it in my script. Uh, and away we go. Now, um, I did this this morning. <laughs> So it's very simple, but you could definitely imagine that when I click on one of these uh, rows, it gives me a preview of the actual data, or if it's you know a set of factors, that it will tell, tell me these are the set of factors, um, or, uh, or tell me how sparse the data is in that column you know, for the years that I've selected. You can do any number of things. Um, and, uh, and to do this uh, without a gadget like this, you're, you're diving through PDFs where they're describing what the columns are about, and then I'm copying and pasting column names, and if it's not right, then I have to you know, run it again. So, um, and again, this was just for one data set, just for the college scoreboard, and yet, um, you know, given the amount of time it took me to write it and how much time it will save for, for anyone who wants to use the college scoreboard, uh, scorecard data set, um, I think it's, it's well worth the, the investment in time. Uh, so, it's not on GitHub yet. Um, so hopefully uh, I'll find some time later this week to publish that. Uh, and finally, I have one last demo. Um, uh, so this is the uh, miles per gallon data set that comes with ggplot2. Uh, let's take a look at it. Um, it just basically has uh, some cars that were reviewed in 1999 by, I think, Motor Trend and then reviewed again in 2008 with their contemporary equivalents and uh, shows some statistics about, or some uh, attributes of the car and then the city and highway mileage. Um, I think this is US based. Uh, so when I was first learning dplyr, um, how many people here have used dplyr? Okay, some of you. Um, dplyr is really an amazing tool, and you can use it to really easily subset and manipulate your data. So in this case, uh, let's say I want to grab the displacement and the uh, year and the highway mileage, right? And now I can run that, and, and it shows me, sorry. So it looks like that. Um, and uh, I can, let's say, use a ggviz visualization to show the displacement versus the highway. 
Okay. Um, so, as I was learning a dplyr, I found it really uh, kind of difficult to visualize what was happening when I make these uh, various calls. So, select is one. I can use mutate to um, to factorize the year. Um, and over and over again, I'm selecting the code that I just wrote and running, and then I want to see what, what happened there. Or if something happens that's weird, like later in my code, then I have to go back and select some earlier chunk of code and run it to remind myself what my data looks like. Uh, so I wrote a little tool to, uh, to help with this. Um, so this is um, a, a pipeline of commands where in the center I'm writing all the individual elements of my dplyr pipeline. Um, so I'm going to start out with my data, uh, so mpg, and you can see on the right that's the data that I'm looking at. Now I'll move to the next stage, and when I move to the next stage, the output of the previous stage now appears on my left. And since it's blank, it's just passing through the data, so on the right I just get the same thing. But um, now if I want to select, I can easily see right in front of me what columns I have to choose from. And I'm going to select, uh, what did I say, displacement, uh, year, and highway. And I can get immediate feedback that yes, indeed, that did what I want. Um, I can remind myself what a previous stage looked like by just mousing over, and as I move back and forth, um, it, it will show me the difference. Um, so in this case, um, what did I want to do? Uh, I wanted to mutate the year to make it a factor. That has no visual difference. Uh, and then I'm going to go ahead and do my ggviz again. So displacement versus highway. Um, the points are fine, but I actually want to add some trend lines, so I'll do layer smooths. And, uh, and then let's add the points back. Uh, and since we can, let's color it by the year. And we'll color the trend line as well. Uh, stroke equals year. Oh, so I can't stroke the trend line because I haven't grouped my data. Okay, and now we see that the trend lines are separate. Um, and let's say I want to um, I want to uh, adjust the smoothness of that trend line. Okay, so I can just play with this value until I see something that looks sensible. Okay. And now that I'm happy with my overall visualization, I can hit done. And uh, when I go back to our studio, uh, where my cursor was, it's now inserted the code that I inserted into that pipeline. Um, so uh, th this is barely working. <laughs> uh, this is very, very, very much demoware. But I thought um, that it'd be useful to get you guys thinking about this so that as you're thinking about your own projects and your own data, you can think about uh, cases where this might be useful. And then hopefully, you know, in a few weeks or whatever, when we can actually work with the RStudio IDE team and get this all hooked up and working really nicely, um, that, that we've kind of uh, set the stage for, for this to be a very useful technique. Okay. Um, how are we? Are we over? Okay. Um, so I just wanted to give one uh, uh, one quick answer to an objection that I've heard a couple of times of, of, of things uh, with Shiny in particular, and that I know we're going to hear about gadgets, uh, which is that why. Why should I care? You know, especially people who have been around for a very long time. They say we had linked brushing and interactive graphics in the 70s with Lisp machines. You know, like why is this stuff considered cool now? Um, and I would say that. Uh, the reason we think that Shiny is really interesting compared to these custom tools that have existed and continue to exist um, is, uh, and, and you know, there, there are new versions of this, like, uh, like there's Tableau for, you know, more, more kind of simple uh, manipulation, but there's also um, Gigobi, and, and uh, there, there are always new, new custom tools coming out for doing interactive graphics. So the reason that we think using Shiny to do interactive graphics is, is interesting is, number one, tight integration with R. So any kind of analysis that you can do with R, any kind of statistics,
statistical methods, machine learning or whatever that you can do from R, uh, you can use from your Shiny apps. Um, inst inst installation and deployment has traditionally been really problematic for a lot of these tools. They're often distributed as either you know, open source tool that has a bunch of requirements that you have to go hunt down or uh, you know, something that needs to be installed on every user's machine. Um, and uh, really the most important thing, I think, is this third point, that new utilities can be built just by regular R users, that um, you don't have to be an expert like you would to build uh, a custom tool like a Tableau or like a, a Gigobi. Um, we designed Shiny for, for anyone to be able to build interactive tools of their own. And in fact, not only is it easy to learn, but the actual cost of writing these in terms of the lines of code and amount of time is so dramatically lower than what it is to write custom apps for visualizations that now we think it's worthwhile to make a custom utility app for each new data type. So if you're the author of a package that does some kind of time series analysis or something like that, um, we think it's worth your while to think about what kind of interactive things do my users want to do just for my data type and create gadgets and apps around uh, that data type. Um, and in fact, uh, we think it's cheap enough to even write throwaway utility apps for a project. So um, you know that, that college uh, scorecard is um, one example but you might have a project you know you're going to be working with this client and this data for you know, six months and, uh, and it's worth it to write tools to just help you work with the specific data that they have. So, um, so that's all I have. Do we have time for maybe yeah. a question or two? Hi. <laughs> Uh, yeah, they're kind of scattered around. Um, I'll have the slides available for download, I assume, and then the links will be in the slides. Thanks very much. That's a pretty awesome presentation. There's some really exciting tools coming out for yeah, coming, coming soon. Uh, I like, really love the idea of being able to get the code from uh, you know, the pipeline back to the, uh, the script. Is there any idea with your other widgets to do maybe getting the code from the subsetting? Absolutely, and um, that's something that we really uh, need to think about how to do this right. Um, it's it's there's a there's a reproducibility problem here that gets introduced anytime you talk about interactive tools, and I think in order to address that, we really need to be careful what we let users do versus what we kind of enable them to do themselves. And uh, and so um, that had not honestly occurred to me when I made the ggplot demos, um, but it occurred to me by the time I did the college scorecard ones. So I think that part of the work that we at our studio have to do before we're ready to roll this out to everybody on our blog and tell them to go start making gadgets is to define some best practices about what gets returned from your uh, you know done button are you returning a code snippet? Are you returning parameters? Or are you returning data? Or maybe you give the option to the user, or maybe you have some way to return all three. So maybe it's you're returning the data, but there's an attribute on it for the code, and there's an attribute on it for the parameters. Those are all things that we have to figure out. I think we have the right people to figure it out. So um, we'll, we'll get to a nice place, I'm sure. Uh, one more question? Hi. Uh, Shiny versus Slideify. Slideify is um, a package for making presentations for R. Um, I, th I think a more direct comparison would be between uh, Slideify and um, IO Slides, which is a package that comes with, um, or a, a theme that comes with R Markdown. Um, I honestly, I use Keynote for most of my presentations because they don't actually involve much, uh, you know, statistical stuff. Um, but um, you know, I think part of the really great thing about being in the R community right at this point in time is that there's just so much energy around combining R. Uh, and what's good about R with the web. Um, one thing that I didn't have time to mention today was HTML widgets, which is a really great um, package that we have developed in collaboration with the author of uh, Slideify. So, um, you know, there, there are really a lot of different approaches that people are pursuing to combining R uh, with interesting web-based and interactive stuff. And uh, to me, I think that's great. We're not too proud to steal great ideas wherever we see them, uh, or because everything open source to you know throw in our efforts and, and help improve those other packages as well so all right thank you very much oh sorry one more
Okay, well, I'll, I'll be available uh, at the uh, booth for the, uh, the next couple of days, so we're, we're right near the entrance. Uh, look for the R Studio table. So, thank you very much.